Hello, Swamp Dweller. I found your channel after your 10 scary and strange park ranger horror stories video appeared on my YouTube homepage. And I noticed you cover a lot of missing persons and missing 411 style cases. It's quite difficult for me to talk about, so excuse me if my retelling is less than stellar. But I think you might be interested in what happened to my brother, Jacob. Outside of a few initial news reports back in the early 90s, it's not one of those heavily featured cases in the media, so I don't think your viewers will have heard much about it. Now, having gotten my little disclaimer out of the way, I'll get on with it. Every 4th of July when I was a kid, my dad would drive me, my Uncle Ralph, and my little brother out to a place called Big Bear Lake in my native California. Big Bear is a beautiful snow-fed reservoir, set into the hills about 30 miles outside of San Bernardino. Given how pretty it is up there, it's only natural that the South Shore is teeming with cozy, cookie-cutter log cabins, and little marinas offering water skiing lessons. The hills around Big Bear are also home to a number of relatively flat, tree-ringed meadows that are designated as campgrounds, and it's at one of those that we'd pitch our tent come Independence Day before firing up the grill, mingling with other campers, and watching the fireworks with awe and wonder as the sun came down. I used to look forward to those camping trips every year. They were the highlight of my summers. So I suppose it is ironic that one of those camping trips will come to haunt me for the rest of my adult life. The final trip to Big Bear we ever made as a family. The one where my little brother disappeared without a trace. It was the 4th of July, 1991, another roasting California summer. Since we had arrived earlier that morning, my dad and uncle had long since set up the grill and were making friendly with some of the other campers, while 10-year-old me and 6-year-old Jacob played with a group of their kids. I remember two of their moms going off to pee or something, since the only public bathrooms were down on the shore back then and a group of us kids decided we would subject them to a playful kind of ambush. So we found ourselves a few hiding places along the rough trail the moms would be heading back on, and prepared to strike. The two women must have spotted a poorly hidden gaggle of giggling children from a mile off, but they're sweet enough to feign a surprise when we all jump out at them. For a few moments, I felt ten feet tall, like a pint-sized green beret or something and I looked around for Jake so we could celebrate our victory over the Amazonian enemy. But Jake was nowhere to be seen. Last I saw of him, he was running up the trail, trying to find a suitable hiding spot. So I wandered through the shrubs for a while, calling out his name here and there. But again, nothing. I figured he'd wandered back to the campground, but when I did the same, there was still no sign of Jake and I remember asking my dad and uncle if they had seen him. To think it all started with such a casual, nonchalant question. It all seems so surreal to me now. What followed was a long, slow buildup of tension. A mild concern that twisted and blackened into abject panic and crushing fear. At first, it was just me and my uncle Ralph walking through the woods, calling out Jake's name. Then... We were asking the other kids if they had seen him. Then it was almost every other adult fanning out around the pine-thick hillsides while my dad called the cops. By the time the sun was starting to set, the campground was teeming with cops and forest rangers who took turns questioning people as they gradually turned the place into a kind of makeshift headquarters. I must have told the same story to a dozen different uninformed and plain-clothed officials from a variety of divisions and departments. And by the time I gave a statement to two plain-clothed state police detectives, I actually felt detached from what was happening. I don't think I quite understood the implications. Like, I remember just wanting Jake to stop hiding and come out so we could all just go home, you know? I remember the cops telling my dad that he should just go home and rest, and that they would be in touch as soon as they had any information. But he wouldn't leave, and I watched as my uncle had to practically drag him back to his car before we all finally drove home. Like I said, I just wanted this all to end, and as I fell asleep that night to the sound of my mother's desperate sobs, I wondered how long it would take before Jake was going to come back safely. But Jake wasn't coming home, 
and it took a two-week-long search and rescue operation that spans the entire San Bernardino National Forest for us to realize this. After that, my family started to slowly fall apart. Mom kept it together for a while. She didn't blame Dad at first, but not out loud anyway. After the second round of police visits, she wasn't shy about letting him know whose fault she thought this was. By that time, my dad had started drinking pretty heavily. Constantly hearing about what a crappy father he was and how he should have been keeping an eye on his son. He just fell off entirely. Then one day, I came home from school and his car wasn't in the driveway. He couldn't handle it anymore. He'd gone to live with my uncle over in Vernon. But what could have possibly prompted such a change in behavior from my mom? What could those two state police detectives have told my parents that had them hating each other so much? It took me years to find out, but being a little older didn't make it any less terrifying. About three or four months after the search for Jake's body was called off, police got a call from one of the other campers who had been at Deer Group Campground that day. Apparently, this person had left something out of their witness statement that they believed might be pertinent to the investigation. A short while before my dad alerted the other campers that my brother was missing, the person had been walking from the lakeside when he'd seen someone moving through the woods away from the direction of the campground. Given that they were moving through some quite dense pine forest while facing away from them, the caller couldn't give much of a description. But, they did say that the person had some kind of yellow cloth over their shoulder. Some uh, astute detective then double-checked the description of what Jake was wearing that day. And, as I can testify, I found that my brother had been wearing a canary yellow t-shirt on the day he went missing. It wasn't a sack on the person's back. It was my little brother. Yet, despite such a compelling lead, the police never really took the caller seriously. The commonly accepted theory is that Jake wandered off into the woods trying to find a hiding spot, then was spotted, stalked, and taken by some kind of animal, be it a black bear, a cougar, or possibly even a coyote. Even in the face of the park rangers failing to find any kinds of remains, as well as the call from the latecomer witness, the official stance did not change. But when I found out exactly what the guy had said, I started to understand why his statement had come into such dispute among law enforcement. After explaining that he thought he had seen a figure walking away from the campgrounds, carrying that bright yellow colored sack, he attempted to give the police some rough idea of who they were looking for. It was just over 20 years after the incident, shortly after Jake was declared legally deceased, that I finally managed to talk to the detective who took this guy's statement but he remembered every word of what had been said. At first, it had been a witness statement much like any other, but soon this detective was shooting his partner incredulous looks, as their witness statement was turning into something unusual. Naturally, since he hadn't been facing them, the witness couldn't describe the figure's face, but he was able to note the person's dark hair and that they wore similarly dark clothing including what looked to be some kind of winter jacket. Winter jacket? In the middle of California summer? Do the math on that one real quick. So, that's where the statement starts to get a little weird. But then the next thing is the positioning and the timing of the sighting. The cop could not remember the exact math that was done to work this out, but he said if this mystery figure really did have my brother over his shoulder to be in the position to be sighted at this particular time, he would have been jogging, or have the giant strides of someone maybe eight or nine feet tall. Which is ridiculous, right? A nine foot tall kidnapper. Really. Running up and down hills under the baking burdew sunshine? In a winter coat? With a six year old boy on his shoulder? You start putting it together, and either my brother was taken by a cougar, partially eaten, or had his remains buried for later, or... He was kidnapped by a world-class, but very inappropriately dressed athlete. And suddenly, the conclusion just seems a little clearer. But that's only if you discount a few other crucial details of the guy's witness statement. Because as the detective was quick to inform me, this witness did actually describe the figure as being abnormally tall. How the piece of cloth didn't even cover their entire shoulder as they lumbered, seemingly exhausted through the pines. But the thing that gets to me is how the witness said at one point 
The figure stopped, turned, and looked right at them. And that even from that distance, he could tell that there was something horribly, horribly wrong with the figure's face. I was sitting face to face with the guy when he told me that, in a bar in Fayetteville, Arkansas, 20 years after Jake went missing. You think an ex-cop wouldn't be able to say such a thing without laughing, or at least shake their head about how dumb it sounded, but he sounded haunted by it, like a part of him actually believed it. And it's at that moment that I realized I was going to have to unlearn everything I thought I knew about Jake's disappearance. It took another couple of years before I realized I could actually do something, that it wasn't just cops or private eyes that could investigate a person's disappearance. But by that time, my dad had passed, and my mom was living in some religious commune out in Salt Lake City or something. All the cops that had worked the case had retired or moved up the ladder, and my uncle was dying of stage 3 lung cancer. I knew how to get hold of my mom, and was actually able to get her on the phone. The group she's with is weird, but not unfriendly. But as soon as I mentioned Jacob's name, she hung up. I get it though, she spent 25 years getting over it. I understand exactly why she does not want to go waking snakes. Next stop was my Uncle Ralph's place over in Vernon. He had this sweet, older Mexican lady living with him, who made sure he had his pain meds. But he still wasn't doing too good. I hated seeing him in that grim, dusty, chemical stinking hellscape. But as he put it, he worked there all his life. He'd die there too. Ralph leveled with me. He'd always been against my mom and dad's idea of just accepting that Jake was gone. He said he understood my mom's idea that the false hope would just consume them, but reminded me that acceptance hadn't been easier on my father and his alcohol-related death, or my mom and her goddamn doomsday cult friends, his words, not mine. Needless to say, he approved of my proposition to search for answers regarding Jake's disappearance. But he did have a caveat. He said the point wasn't so much to find anything. The search would be its own reward. I'd be able to reassure myself that I'd at least tried to do something and that might just prevent me from losing my mind or drinking myself to death. And so it came to pass, for the first time in 24 years, I made that faithful journey up into the hills around San Bernardino, to the last place I saw my little brother alive, Big Bear Lake. When I say it was not easy, I mean that in every possible way. Emotionally it was tough, but getting the time off of work and driving down from Oregon was a real son of a bee. But I had my plan laid out, and I was sticking to it. I'd hike around Big Bear every day for a week, and just sort of see what I could turn up. I know that seems like a dumb plan, but my uncle said it wasn't so much about finding Jake, but rather finding a way to secure my own sanity. I had booked myself six nights at the Bear Creek Resort. Not the fanciest place, but it's a location near the southern trailhead and it made it preferable to any of the other extravagant hotels. Besides, what I was about to do was about as far removed from a vacation as I could possibly imagine. The first day's hiking felt like opening up an old wound. My mood sank lower and lower as I walked towards the trails, towards Deer Group Campground, and by the time I actually laid eyes on the place I felt like a scared little boy again. It was heavily overgrown and completely deserted, but the way the ground flattened out a little, the way the trees were positioned, I recognized it instantly. I could make out almost the exact spot where we had camped that 4th of July. The trail that me and Jake walked off on. Places the cops had parked their four-wheel drives to shine flashlights onto maps splayed across their hoods. I don't believe in ghosts, but after seeing that old campground, I believe a place can be haunted. Not by evil spirits or poltergeists or anything like that but by bad memories, specters in the mind. I fought back tears as I walked the overgrown trail we hit on, then felt a little rush of fear as I realized I was walking the exact same patch of dirt that Jake had just before he went missing. Like I said, that first day was the toughest, but things did not get easier as the week went by. I kept hiking the trail south of the lake, slowly refamiliarizing myself with the area, just keeping my eyes out for anything of interest. But as you can imagine, that didn't amount to much. 
and although those first few days in Big Bear were deeply cathartic, I was no closer to finding what happened to Jake. And by the Saturday my second to last day in Big Bear, I was content to drive back to Eugene no more enlightened than I had been previously. I'd had almost an entire week to reflect on what happened or did not happen to Jake, and somehow, being closer to home, to where it all happened in the first place, gave me a deeper feeling of closure, and I can't tell you how good that felt. I should have known. I'd find a way to spoil that for myself. Because at one point, as I'm walking through the woods about two or three miles east of Deer Group Campground, I catch my foot on something and end up face down in the dirt, completely winded. I fell so hard I thought I might have cracked something, and as I got up and dusted myself off, I turned to see what I had tripped over. I had kicked away some dirt and pine needles to get a good look at it, and lo and behold, at the base of this small rocky shelf jutting out of the soil was an opening in the ground. It was maybe only about a foot wide, and turned out to be only slightly wider than my phone, and I'm sure you can imagine how I figured that out. Out of all the things I have heard or read about the search and rescue operation following Jake's disappearance, I'd never heard anything about any caves under Big Bear, and in all the rambling I'd done over the previous days, I hadn't seen one single cave entrance on any of the hillsides, and neither did Big Bear's website advertise any kind of caving activities, and you can bet your ass that that's an angle I covered before I drove down here. Anyway, the phone thing. At first I shined my phone's flashlight into the fissure, which is how I determined that it was rather deep into the earth. Then, since my phone case has a little wrist loop which stops me from dropping it, I was able to tie my headphones to it before carefully lowering my phone into the aperture of the earth. And since I did this while a video was recording, I figured I might be able to get an idea of how deep or large the cave was. I give it a good minute, making sure I twist and turn the headphone wire so to get as much as a 360 recording of whatever was down there. But when I pull the phone back up and play the video back, I don't see a thing. I can see where the flashlight is illuminating and the immediate darkness in front of the camera, but the light isn't bouncing back off of any cave floors or walls. I'm no geologist, but I don't think you need a college degree to work out that there's a huge damn cave system in the Burdu National Forest, and one that seems to have been previously undiscovered. I spent the remainder of that day trying to find an entrance to such a cave system, and had no luck whatsoever. The following day, I had this dull ache in my elbow and ribs where I had fallen, so after a quick visit to the Bear Valley Community Hospital, where I was assured that it was nothing but some heavy bruising, I decided to give the San Burdu National Forest HQ a call to inquire about the cave system I inadvertently discovered. Even though I had not seen or heard anything about caves around Big Bear, I was still surprised to hear that not a single park ranger had ever come across any kind of subterranean passage during all of their years rambling around the forest. When asked why I asked about such a thing, I explained to a friendly park ranger by the name of Mike Garza that it involved a missing persons case from two decades prior, and after that he seemed even more willing to help out than he was before. He said he'd make his own inquiries before heading up to the area I'd specified and that he'd call me back during the following week or so to let me know if he had found anything. Again, I was almost certain the cops would have covered such an angle in their initial investigations, but still it could not hurt to try, right? Well, a week goes by, and I have yet to hear back from Ranger Mike regarding the cave system. I figure he's just busy or something, so I don't take it personally. Only, when I called to check if he had made any progress, I was told that Mike wasn't stationed with the San Bernardino team anymore, and that he had handed in his resignation just a few days before. That seemed incredibly sudden, and I asked the person who answered what prompted such a sudden departure. The guy had no idea, but when I mentioned that I'd spoken to Mike regarding a previously undiscovered cave system, there was a long and pregnant pause. The guy then told me that Mike had mentioned something like that in his final week on the job, and that one day, when he had returned from a longer than usual patrol, he seemed... different. When I asked him to clarify exactly what he meant, the guy said Mike seemed anxious to the point of paranoia, 
refused to talk about what was bothering him, then announced he would be quitting a few days later. He cleared out his desk, emptied his locker, and that was the last day they had seen him down at the Burdu Ranger HQ. I've tried to get some contact details for Mike Garza, but as one former colleague of his said, Mike just about dropped off the face of the earth after he quit. I've got many, many questions surrounding what happened to Mike after he left the Forest Service, with the main one being, what the hell did he see or do after we spoke that left him so freaked out? And whatever it was, could it possibly be connected to my little brother's disappearance? Jake's apparent abduction is something I've been privately investigating for years now, but apparently, I've hit some kind of brick wall. And until I find out what happened to Mike Garza, I don't think I'll ever get anything in the way of definitive answers. But as I said, this is something I'm continually working on. And in light of what I've discovered, it's not something I'll be giving up on anytime soon. I hope you have found what I wrote to be of interest, considering the content of your channel. And if you'd like to hear any updates regarding my investigation, please let me know, as I won't hesitate to inform you of any updates. I hope to hear from you soon. Yours truly, Ray Duwall.